Good evening, everyone. Time for another member update. We're going to start out with the chart of Litecoin. This is the coin that most of the altcoins that I was investing in that I'd recommended, Zeitcoin, Flo, uh, Florin coin, and others. This is actually the coin they're denominated in. So seeing those positions go down, but obviously since Litecoin is up about 100% um, since mid-June, um, it's hard to lose anything on that. Now you can see, the reason I bring this up is because Litecoin and Bitcoin, but Litecoin especially, uh, has been the big mover since the Greek news. And that's kind of interesting to think about. Now, most of that, most of that move is coming out of China. If you go to, well, you can go to different sites to compare, you know, the volume, but right now about 90% of the volume in the cryptocurrencies comes out of China. So you can see the move here. Um, quite a lot of volume, another kind of pennant forming here. Now, of course, when we go way back, you can see that this is just a little blip on the radar screen compared to where it was. So there's a long way back. But, you know, if you're buying here, if you've been buying at the lows, then it's been pretty good. So I want to dig into this story about JP Morgan that broke on Zero Hedge and about the comptroller of the currency and their uh, report of the size of the derivatives book in precious metals specifically, but uh, in all commodities that uh, has now been reported. And we're going to talk about the fact that it has to be reported and why that's important. But before we do that, I want to listen to the most recent interview, interview with Jim Willie on uh, Turd Ferguson's TF Metals report. And uh, you'll have to forgive the, any fireworks in the background. Um, so let's listen to this interview uh, and I want you to think about what Jim Willie says about what I'm going to call farce majeure, which, uh, if Willie is correct, is already happening. That's going to be really important. We're looking at this story, so let's listen to this. Tie it all together in, in how many minutes? One? Yeah. <laughs> no, take as long as you want. I'm just saying, this is about the last thing I think. We'll, we'll just put it all in this, and then we'll wrap it up. But take as long as you want. I mean, that's a lot to talk about, believe me. That's just the last topic I wanted to cover. Okay. You mentioned that the, the Chinese trying to take control of the gold fix, the, the once per day. The Chinese are trying to do something that will rock the London and New York corrupt bankers off their chairs. They're trying to have gold delivery off futures contracts in Shanghai. What a novel idea. Gee, stunning. The the J.P. Morgan folks have not delivered gold on a gold futures contract since June of 2012. Okay, so that's what I want you to think about. He's saying that they're actually already operating under force majeure. That's three years. They force cash settlement. In other words, they don't have a gold market. Right. They have yeah. a gold cash market. Yeah. They have a paper gold market. A derivative market, yeah. Okay, so that's that's what he's reporting. I don't have any reason to doubt him. I've heard other rumors, especially about silver, even worse ones where people on the comics have gotten strange phone calls saying, why do you want this silver if they decided to take delivery? So it's almost like we're already in a secret force majeure that's going on, but it will, and it is, I think, starting to come to a head. And that leads us to this big story here that's on Zero Hedge J.P. Morgan just cornered the commodity derivative market, and this time there's proof. So we have this report that came out of the comptroller of the currency. And uh, before we get into this, I, I want to explain to you why this is important. Um, and it's linked in this article, but the office of the comptroller of the currency has actually been around since the Civil War. And you can see here's a list of all the heads of it. And their primary duty is, uh, here's their main objectives, to ensure safety and soundness of the national banking system and fosters competition, etc. But, but basically, uh, they're regulators of the banking system. Now, the big question that comes up, of course, is why is the OCC giving a report on derivatives activities? Well, the reason why they're doing that is because they 
not only repealed Dodd-Frank, but they actually passed this uh, bill that puts, as Zero Hedge calls it, the Cronybus Last Minute Act, that puts the taxpayer on the hook for derivatives. In other words, they put the tax, the, the FDIC um, in the past has guaranteed your savings accounts or checking accounts up to $100,000. They bumped it up to $250,000 during the financial crisis. And uh, then what happened was with the repeal of uh, the Glass-Steagall Act, I might have misspoke and said Dodd-Frank, but with the repeal of the Glass-Steagall Act, which created a wall of separation between the speculative monies of the banks that they used to play in the casino and the monies that were guaranteed uh, the savings account, that wall was broken down. Now, this act is where they actually... Uh, broke down even further the difference between derivatives and savings and basically uh, they put the savers in the back of the line behind the derivatives. So so there's 303 trillion dollars in derivatives that are that are basically guaranteed by the taxpayer. And that's what they did in this bill. Now the reason why I'm bringing this up is because that is the reason why the OCC, the Office of the Comptroller of the Currency, that's the reason why this office is responsible for regulating that now, because the derivatives are actually uh, directly impacting, they have the potential to impact the national banking system. So if you remember in the past, there were calls, uh, I think it was Brooksley Bourne who originally called for a regulation of the derivatives and others have called for that. And it kind of in a backdoor way, now we're seeing that. So we have this story breaking here about this huge change in J.P. Morgan's derivative book, especially its precious metals and commodities book. So I'm going to read this whole thing because it's so important. For years, there had been speculation, rumor, and hearsay that J.P. Morgan had cornered the U.S. commodities market. Now, finally, we have documented proof. Traditionally, we look at the OCC's quarterly bank report on derivatives activities to see which was the largest bank in the U.S. in terms of total notional derivative holdings. The reason being that, like on frequent occasions in the past, we find some stunning results, such as most recently in January when we wrote that for the first time Citigroup had eclipsed J.P. Morgan as the largest U.S. bank in total derivatives. Now, if you remember a while back, Vic Swear had reported that, that Citigroup had taken the torch from J.P. Morgan in the silver suppression scheme. And so this kind of maybe confirms that. There's a long list, apparently. I don't even remember the names, all of them. I think it was Alex Brown and then a bunch of others. Then it was Bear Stearns and J.P. Morgan. Uh, a whole bunch of banks, big banks, involved in the silver suppression. But uh, now J.P. Morgan has gone back and eclipsed Citigroup. With just over $70 trillion compared to perennial mega bank J.P. Morgan, $65.3 trillion as of the third quarter of 2014, explaining why Citigroup had drafted the swaps push-out language in the omnibus bill. So that was the omnibus bill that I just read you that uh, pushes the swaps into the FDIC guarantees and puts the taxpayer on the hook for derivatives. And not only that, puts you behind them in line for collecting your money. Uh, that, that was a sort, similar sort of thing that we saw if you remember in the MF Global catastrophe where the courts actually ruled that the segregated accounts of the customers were second in line, even though they were supposed to be segregated funds, the courts ruled that the loan to JP Morgan actually took priority over the segregated customer funds. That's the reason why Ann Barnhart quit uh, that business. Uh, but anyway, that's an aside. And while this time there was little exciting to report at the consolidated level, J.P. Morgan overtook Citi in quarter four, only for Citi to once again become the world's largest bank in total derivatives with 56.6 trillion compared to 56.2 trillion for J.P. Morgan and 52 trillion for Goldman. And in fact, total notional derivatives tumbled from 220.4 trillion in quarter four to 203 trillion in quarter one, the lowest since 2008. And I'm not going to go into that chart. An absolutely shocking blockbuster emerges when looking at the underlying component data presented, presenting Exhibit 12, notional amounts of commodity contracts by maturity. Even a CFTC regulator would be able to spot the outlier charted below. And this is the chart you can see. In first quarter of 2015, the amount of notional commodity and equity contracts uh, by maturity. 
uh, you can see the explosion. This is in billions. That's four trillion. So this number in the first quarter went from it's hard to even read it. It's about two hundred billion to four trillion. It it made a twenty fold move in one quarter. Continuing, what the chart above shows is that after fluctuating around the low to mid $200 billion range for the past five years, in the first quarter, the amount of commodities with a maturity of under one year exploded to a record $3.9 trillion. So these, these, there's one year on this ticking bomb. Sadly, the OCC provides no actual explanation for why there was such an epic surge in commodity derivatives within the U.S. banking system in the first quarter, so we decided to explore what we found is what those who have for years accused J.P. Morgan of cornering the commodity markets have known because it is none other than J.P. Morgan's commodity derivative book primarily in the less than one maturity bucket which exploded from just 131 billion to a gargantuan and never seen before 3.8 trillion in fact as the chart below shows while historically J.P. Morgan has accounted for just over 50 percent of total commodity holdings among the U.S. commercial banks in the first quarter this number soared to a stratospheric 96 percent which by anybody's standards is the very definition of cornering the market so you can see here in the close-up of this chart I'll make it a little bit bigger here uh, the red line is J.P. Morgan commodities, and the blue is is total commodities. So you can see what percentage J.P. Morgan has of that. And this black line is percentage of total. You can see that increase to nearly 100% of the commodity derivatives, and that in, included in that is going to be silver and gold. We don't know what prompted J.P. Morgan's derivative book to soar to such a never-before-seen amount, but the number most certainly looks abnormal on both an absolute and relative basis, especially considering that no other banks boosted their particular derivative books with the same vigor. So what's going on here? We decided to dig down some more when we encountered something even more perplexing. Because whereas in previous quarterly updates, the OCC broke out the FX and gold categories as separate derivative items as seen in this most recent chart from the fourth quarter update. And you can see in this chart, you have Forex up here, foreign exchange, and you have gold. They're broken out into separate categories. In the first quarter, once again, quite inexplicably, the OCC decided to lump these two products together making any credible observation about the total notional outstanding of just gold derivatives impossible. But wait, we thought that according to the former chairman Bernanke, any gold anything but is anything but currency. Is the OCC suddenly disagreeing with that assessment? And so you can see here, now you have Forex and gold. So you have one big number. And you can see that it's, it's getting significantly larger. But they're grouping them together. What does that mean? Well, it could mean a couple of things. It could mean that, as the BIS recently stated, that gold is the equivalent of currency as far as Forex reserves goes. Or it could be the opposite. It could be what they're implying here, that perhaps the OCC is involved with trying to hide what's going on in the gold derivatives market. Furthermore, while in all previous iterations of the OCC's Table 9 Gold Derivatives Notionals by maturity were explicitly broken out, as we can see in this fourth quarter example from 2014 in the table below, starting in the first quarter of 2015, the gold section in Table 9 no longer exists. Although we can see that while J.P. Morgan cornered commodities, it was Citi that had its total derivative notional of precious metals undergo a massive jump, also for reasons unknown. One would almost think the OCC is hiding something as the demand of U.S. commercial banks. So while we no longer know what just total gold derivatives outstanding is, for some unexplained reason, we do know that the combined total of FX and gold just hit an all-time high. And while the OCC did all it could to mask the gold line item by lumping it with Forex, it still kept precious metals as is, although we assume that this too will be lumped in with Forex and gold shortly. It is this chart that shows something that's truly odd when it comes to U.S. commercial bank activity in the precious metals space. And here's the chart here. You can see this notional amounts of gold and precious metals contracts by maturity. Now, what is gold and precious metals? Is that gold and silver or is that gold, silver, platinum, and palladium? I'm assuming it would be gold, silver, platinum, and palladium. But since platinum and palladium are so tiny as far as the volume and dollar amounts that we're talking gold and silver, 
how much of this is silver derivatives to suppress the silver market? I would guess probably the majority. And you can see that number. That number is over $60 trillion. Oh wait, no, I'm sorry, $60 billion. That's in billions. $60 billion in gold and other precious metal derivatives. As we talked about before, uh, at a price of $16 an ounce, uh, a billion ounces that's mined or recycled just roughly each year is $16 billion. And yet you're seeing here uh, over $60 billion in, in the precious metal derivatives. So in summary, this is what we know. In the first quarter, JP Morgan cornered the commodity derivative market with a total derivative exposure of just over $4 trillion, an increase of 1,691% from just 226 billion in one quarter. What we don't know is why did the OCC decide to effectively eliminate its gold derivative breakdown by lumping it with Forex? And why is there a 237% increase in the total amount of precious metals, which includes gold contracts in the quarter from 22.4 billion to 75.6 billion? We've sent an email requesting much needed clarification from the office of the currency controller, although we are not holding our breath. So there it is. Um, that is a little bit more confirmation that this, I will call it farce majeure, is already going on. I think it. I think Jim Willie is right. I think it already is going on. Um, anecdotally, I read the other day, and I don't remember where the article was, but it was a poster who was in China, and he said that in China you cannot find an ounce of physical silver coin form for less than $45 equivalent uh, renminbi price. That's just anecdotal, so I don't know. Um, another interesting thing here on this story, uh, if you remember back in September, Eric Holder took a $77 million job with J.P. Morgan Chase. So the Attorney General going to J.P. Morgan. And what's he doing there? Just after announcing his resignation as U.S. Attorney General, Eric Holder has accepted a top job with Wall Street finance giant J.P. Morgan Chase. Starting in early November, Holder will serve as J.P. Morgan Chase's chief compliance officer, where his responsibilities will include lobbying Congress on the company's behalf and ensuring it gets the best deal possible from any new proposed financial regulations. Holder will also fetch morning coffee and breakfast orders for CEO Jamie Dimon and board members. For his efforts, Holder will earn an annual salary of $77 million plus bonuses for a job well done. In a statement, Holder said taking a job at J.P. Morgan Chase was the logical next step in his career given the revolving door between financial companies and government officials who are supposed to regulate these companies. <laughs> this is kind of a joke article. By joining J.P. Morgan Chase, I'm simply cutting out the middleman, the U.S. Justice Department, and going to work directly for the great Jamie Dimon. So that's kind of an onion-type story on that. So what is going on? Well, I, I suspect that Jim Willie is right. I think that, that a secret force majeure is already in force. Uh, that could be an explanation of why they need so many dollars in that market. Um, how much money is it going to take? How much above spot do you have to offer to have someone decide to settle in cash? Uh, Jim Willie has said uh, a number of times that he has heard that if you want to get gold in bulk, then you're going to have to pay a price of at least $2,000 an ounce. There's no way for me to confirm these rumors or whether or not they're true, but there's these are definitely very strange rumblings, loud rumblings that are going on in the gold market. And uh, this move to China having a type of actual physical delivery guaranteed, and you also apparently aren't going to be able to short unless you have the metal. Uh, I don't know if that's going to be enforced. But uh, currently with the COMEX, all you have to have is a lot of money. And $4 trillion is a lot of money to have in commodity derivatives. And so that's a big story. Uh, we're going to have to wait and see what happens. Obviously, that's another reason to keep stacking. Uh, we're seeing quite a bit of tightness in the, the uh, I'm sorry, uh, the 90% bags. Uh, the thousand ounce, um, 
I can't remember. Oh, junk silver. I'm sorry. Uh, the 90% junk silver bags, we're seeing quite a shortage. Uh, I did a count recently going through compare silver prices and through the different dealers. Some of them were down to one and two bags. And the premium has been hovering around 15, 16, 17%. That for me is kind of like a gauge of people coming into the silver game. That's what I always recommend that people come in with is the 90% silver bag. So that might be an indication of something, but I don't know. Uh, it seems that the markets are fairly tight, but uh, there's still some silver out there if you want to stack. It looks like if this is correct, these $4 trillion worth of commodity derivatives w with precious metal derivatives making up the majority, I would guess, uh, that would only be logical unless oil is a big chunk in there. With all of those being the one year or less, and that is the report from the first quarter, um, that gives the timeline till the end of the year. Um, so based on that and so many other things that are pointing to September to January time frame, it's definitely time to get the stack topped off as much as you can at low prices, uh, get the cash set aside in a safe place, get all the preps ready, uh, if you're into cryptocurrencies, get your coins locked in a wallet away from the exchanges because it looks like, uh, not to make a pun, but it looks like there are a lot of fireworks coming. And we'll talk to you next time.